Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's the time to start. Welcome to this afternoon's session. This is a session of clinical cases. Could we close, close the door, close the door, and the colleagues at the end speak outside? Thank you. Um, so this is a clinical cases session, but it's slightly unusual. This is a new experiment. Uh, my name is Anna Dominczak. I come from University of Glasgow. My co-chair, Professor Rian Towers, also comes from the University of Glasgow. And we're here because we are editor-in-chief and deputy editor-in-chief of Hypertension, the Journal of American Heart Association. This session will be filmed, and the funding for filming and the session has been provided by American Heart Association. This is first time we do something like that at the European meeting, and we're very grateful to AHA uh, for doing this. Um, so we have two cases. These were offered to us for discussion, and the whole audience is invited to participate. So this is a part participant session. We hope that those who will make significant contributions to the session will identify themselves. We will be able to make the note, Denise, where is Denise? Denise, hands up. At the back there is Denise who represents the editorial office, who is in charge of editorial office of hypertension. Denise will make a note and will come back to you to verify your comments because we're going to publish both cases in hypertension, provided you help us and provided it's good enough, because of course we referee everything, and if it isn't good enough, it will not be published. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to ask Professor Towers to introduce the first case. So thank you, Anna, and um, again, welcome to everybody for these two very exciting um, cases that are going to certainly stimulate a lot of discussion, and we absolutely want um, input from the audience. And the first presentation is actually coming from um, the University of Glasgow, and that is going to be a case with resistant hypertension, and this is in a woman, a lady with hypertension. And this case will be presented by Christian and by Dr. Curry, and first we'll ask Dr. Curry to come up, and she will introduce the case to us. Now, this should be, as I said, an interactive type dialogue. There will be pauses at appropriate times within this case presentation, but if you feel you have a question um, at any time, I believe that our speakers are very happy to accept questions during the course of the presentation. So with that, thank you so much. We'll start with the first case. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, and we'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to present this case. I'm going to start with a brief disclaimer. Um, this is not a particularly unusual or rare case of hypertension, and nor are we saying that this represents the gold standard management for a case like this. What we really wanted to do was to illustrate some key discussion points which have been highlighted already throughout the, this meeting, um, and we hope that you'll all be able to contribute, and we'd really like to hear everyone's opinion on the case. So the lady we'd like to present is a 60-year-old female who was referred to the tertiary blood pressure clinic at Glasgow's Western Infirmary five years ago by a consultant cardiologist for management of resistant hypertension. In terms of her clinical background, this lady is a vasculopath. She has ongoing intermittent claudication and had previous bilateral superficial femoral artery occlusions on a background of hypercholesterolemia and a significant smoking history. She has problematic underlying ischemic heart disease, having had angina since 2001, numerous percutaneous interventions and a two-vessel coronary artery bypass graft, and despite this, she had suffered a non-ST elevation MI two years prior to presentation. Her blood pressure on her first visit to the clinic was 182 over 106. And this was despite numerous antihypertensive medications, as you can see in the box in the top corner. So she's on an ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, two diuretics, alpha and beta blockade, 
And this is in addition to our anti-anginal and secondary preventative medications. On review of her case notes and previous clinic documentation, it became apparent that in fact this woman's clinic blood pressure had been elevated for at least the last 10 years, with systolic readings ranging from 150 to 200 millimetres of mercury and diastolic between 90 and 100. So the next step for this patient was that she was admitted to our investigation ward for a week of workup. During this time, her routine biochemistry showed she had normal renal function and electrolytes. Urine albumin to creatinine ratio was just within the microalbuminuric range at 4.2 milligrams per millimole. Her cardiac and mediastinal contours appeared normal on chest X-ray, and neither ECG nor echocardiogram showed any significant left ventricular hypertrophy. Nor do we have any biochemical evidence to suggest pheochromocytoma or primary aldosteronism. In terms of imaging, we have a renal ultrasound that shows two normal-sized, non-obstructed kidneys with no evidence of cortical thinning. And MR angiography showed normal renal vasculature um, with no evidence of renal artery stenosis. She even had an isotope renogram, which again showed normal tracer uptake, excretion and drainage, and that both kidneys were contributing relatively equally to her renal function. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Christian to lead the first stage of discussion. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Gemma. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to go through the list of medications again. And if we look at this, she's certainly on a large number of antihypertensive agents. And if we just look at the definition of resistant hypertension, I think we all agree that treatment-resistant hypertension is commonly defined as being uncontrolled with a blood pressure of more than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, despite three or more antihypertensive agents, of which one should be a diuretic. So she fulfills the criteria for resistant hypertension. I would like to take the opportunity here also to just remind us all that we have, of course, a majority of patients that are slightly different. We would have a majority of patients with easy-to-control hypertension, where we just need one or two, or maybe none at all, to control the hypertension. And we will have difficult-to-control hypertension. These are patients that we can get under 140 over 90, but they may still require quite a battery of antihypertensive agents. But this lady is certainly in this treatment-resistant category. So just to inform the discussion a little bit that we will have in a few minutes, the prevalence of resistant hypertension, there's uh, a number of uh, epidemiological studies on this. Um, majority agree that it's something about 8, 9 to 10 percent of the hypertensive population that are treatment resistant, but this may be also a discussion point just to be informed from your own clinical experience how many patients we actually see with this condition. And what is quite typical for these patients is that we quite often see them when they refer to us as specialists on a number of drugs already. And this is the chart from the ESH guidelines that just says that there is a number of combination therapies that are recommended. And I think most of these patients with resistant hypertension that we see have all of these drugs already. And that is then uh, the situation that we are in. When we look, however, beyond the treatment that is usually recommended, and that is angiotensin receptor blockers, a diuretic, a calcium channel blocker, maybe a beta blocker, um, beyond this, the guidelines are very, very vague. So if you, for example, look into the um, ESH guidelines, you do not find a lot of drugs that are actually named here for treatment options of resistant hypertension or for hypertension where the first line or second or third line treatment doesn't work anymore. We have certainly a number of fourth or possibly fifth line therapies available, and some of them are listed here on the right-hand side. And I would again be very interested in your own opinion on these drugs here. Would they have a role in these patients that we see with treatment-resistant hypertension. The one drug that stands out a little bit is spironolactone here, because for that we have reasonable 
um, trial evidence. Very small studies, but there is some data available, for example, in this analysis of the ASCOT data here, where the addition of spironolactone to the usual antihypertensive medication brought the blood pressure down by a significant amount. So that is the one that is uh, mentioned in a number of the, the guidelines, but the guidelines do not mention much about the other antihypertensive agents that we may consider. So last slide before we can probably have a little bit of a discussion, just this one here. It's not absolutely up to date. It's a slide from 2012, but just showing that there is, of course, some development of new antihypertensive um, drugs, but it is probably fair to say that none of them has really reached the market yet. Some of them are in studies. Um, some of them are probably not as exciting as they promised to be. So I think at the moment we need to, to work with what is available, um, but you've seen in the previous slide that there is a number of fourth and fifth line drugs available and maybe this would be interesting to discuss. At that point, I would probably like to hand over to Rianne to lead right. the discussion on this. Okay, so thank you, Christian. We have here a very interesting patient who comes with resistant hypertension. She's presented on the classical drugs that we would expect based on the guidelines. Um, I have some questions, but perhaps before I ask you the questions, we'll open the questions to the floor. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please, and if you could identify yourselves and come to the microphone. My name is uh, Jan Staassen. Um, I have a few questions. First of all, why was this patient on a thiazide diuretic plus a loop diuretic? That's my first question. The second question is, I don't know the normal values of renin in your lab, but if a patient is on remipril, and on thiazide diuretics and a loop diuretic, what you would expect is an increase in renin activity is the patient if, if the patient is adherent, even if she was taking a beta blocker, as I saw. So please inform us on the range of renin values you have in your lab and whether it was elevated, normal, or low. And the third question, I think the most important one, I have not seen ambulatory blood pressure. And that's the gold standard. You cannot diagnose, treat, or manage anymore in this time any patient with hypertension or referred for hypertension without ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So your point on amb ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is absolutely correct, and that will come in the next sort of phase of discussion. From the point of view of her medication, you know, as, as we said, we're not saying that this is the, an example of the gold standard way to manage this case. And I think here there was potentially an element of too many cooks. This, this woman was also attending a number of secondary and tertiary referral clinics with everyone making adjustments to her medication. So that's probably the reason that there seems some kind of counterintuitive decisions made with her treatment. Um, the issue of her renin and aldosterone and compliance, again, is something that we can... Um, discuss later on. Um, do you have anything to add? I think the, the renin levels were absolutely in the normal range. It's a little bit more than the 30 that she had here, which is the, the, the normal range still. Um, it's, it's probably a point that is really out for discussion here, how much we can interpret this. I fully agree with you that a number of these drugs should have increased the renin. On the other hand, she was on the beta blocker, as you quite rightly said, and I'm not sure if we really have hard data to say how we can interpret data if somebody is on an angiotensin receptor blocker, a diuretic, and a beta blocker, what sort of renin would we actually expect. We do it quite often that we measure the, uh, the um, renin-aldosterone ratio and then uh, quite often we are in this situation like yourself, Jan, that we don't know exactly how to interpret it. We ask additional questions, but we do not know exactly what to do with it. Anna? So I have a related question. I have a related question. I am worried that a woman with such high blood pressure, presumably for a considerable amount of time, has no LVH <coughs> at all. And I still worry about adherence, compliance, I've been very uh, taken by a talk given yesterday by Brian Williams where they showed that people on six drugs are 100% non-adherent. This is almost definite definition. So has she really got resistant hypertension or is it a case of well covered I always take my tablets, doctor, type of non-compliant, non-adherent patient. Please persuade me. I think it will be difficult to persuade you, Anna. 
<laughs> but I can pro provide a little bit of evidence. So one bit of evidence is that we will discuss the adherence issue in, in a minute, and we had the same queries here, obviously, as yourself. Um, the other thing, and that is probably, again, something for discussion within this um, audience here, we have, of course, <coughs> organ damage in this lady. She has had myocardial infarctions. She has peripheral artery disease. So I would not easily tick the box to say, well, she has a falsely high blood pressure and no organ damage just because we didn't find left ventricular hypertrophy. So how far do we rely on these typical organ damages like renal failure or um, an increased albumin creatinine ratio and left ventricular hypertrophy, or would we not say that this patient also has hypertensive organ damage already because she had an MI? Yes, next question, please. Uh, Parvez Iqbal from Chesterfield in UK. Uh, my question is about compliance, and this particular patient um, is in a lucky position to be in the hospital uh, where a treatment could be given under direct supervision. Was that done? We can give you the answer to that shortly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gary? Uh, Gary Jennings, I just take issue with the last point of Christians that, uh, that there is target organ damage in this lady. She's got 40 pack years of tobacco smoking behind her. She's got hypercholesterolemia. She's got high cardiovascular risk anyway, and you'd almost be surprised if she didn't have atherosclerosis, irrespective of what her blood pressure was. Yeah, so we will show something on her uh, carotid ultrasound in, in a bit, so she will certainly have a degree of, of damage there. But I, I think it's, it's a case, and Rian, we, we discussed this a, a number of times. Again, it would be interesting to find out what the audience thinks about this, because we have these patients who definitely have high blood pressure, but compared to the high blood pressure, relatively little organ damage. Um, Let's not discuss it specifically with this patient here, but we have patients where we think it's kind of the wrong way around here, and we do not understand the mechanism very well here. Yes, um, I think Christian brings up a really important point, and we're seeing increasingly in our clinics patients who've got confirmed resist or high, very high blood pressure based on ambulatory readings, and yet they've got absolutely normal renal function, no evidence of LVH, no ischemic heart disease, and we find that these patients are becoming more and more prevalent in our clinics, we don't really understand what is happening. And we often question whether there might be a differential between central blood pressure and peripheral blood pressure. And perhaps this is something that we may be able to discuss later as we progress this case. But um, we'll go on to two more questions, and then we'll go back to the case. Perhaps we'll be able to get some of these questions um, that will be answered by Christian and Gemma. But um, just over to Jan for now. So you are also asked which drug we would not prescribe to this patient. I think this lady is uh, extremely vulnerable to heart failure because she has previous myocardial infarctions, she has coronary heart disease, even if she doesn't have left ventricular hypertrophy. She's prone to, uh, because of her blood pressure levels, she's prone to develop heart failure. Now, if you look at the trials of moxonidine, there is an increased mortality in patients with heart failure. So that drug I would certainly not have prescribed to this patient, although it's very popular among cardiologists. Thank you very much, Jan, for confirming this, because this was the only drug that I mentioned in some of the clinic letters specifically and said this is the one that I don't want her to take for exactly the reasons that they say. The other thing is that she also has significant coronary disease, and again, it's something where the moxonidine is really not a very good option. But maybe we get some ideas for, for any other fourth or fifth line drugs that we could have tried, or would the audience gen, um, generally suggest that we should try and work it up more closely or do any other things? Last uh, question for yes. this session, then I we'll like, move uh, on. Mm -hmm. Again, to say that it's very amazing not to have an LVH, not a microalbuminuria, and uh, just to have a heavy heart disease. Uh, I would like to say that it's not just an organ damage because maybe we be, be too atherosclerotic, so have very stiff uh, arteries. And I think this septic hypertension is. Uh, something in the uh, have in the mind for these uh, patients. Well, I think you're prompting us in a wonderful way because that is the next part that we would like to discuss in, in the case as well. So thank, thank you. you for that. I think we'll move on now and we'll learn more about the uh, the patient. Okay. So between 2010 and 2012, this lady continued to attend the blood pressure clinic on a regular basis. 
I should say that her BMI was relatively normal. I think it was 26, but she made some dietary changes in terms of calorie and salt restriction and lost three kilograms in weight over a six month period. Her antihypertensive regime was adjusted and the changes are highlighted in purple on the slide if they project okay. Um, so her frusamide dose was increased, her ramipril was doubled, her alpha blockade was doubled and spironolactone was added at a dose of 25 milligrams once daily. Again, I should highlight that this lady's attending a number of clinics. She's seeing cardiologists, vascular surgeons and the blood pressure service and I don't think all of these changes were necessarily made by staff at the blood pressure clinic. In parallel to this, she, her ischemic heart disease continued to be problematic. She had a further non-ST elevation MI towards the end of 2010, requiring another percutaneous procedure, and was then commenced on Evabridine for control of her difficult-to-treat angina. So this is her first ambulatory blood pressure monitor that was done in 2011. It's quite old. I hope it projects okay, but I think the first thing that we would all probably remark on from the trace is that there's a suboptimal number of readings here. Um, Nevertheless, it confirms that her overall blood pressure is 155 over 90, but with quite a variation in her readings. So she has a minimum blood pressure of 119 over 56 and maximum of 203 over 119. So the audience have very kindly already raised a number of kind of interesting discussion points and we'd like to try and address a couple of these now. The first was the issue of compliance. So during this lady's week on the ward, obviously she had her antihypertensives administered by nursing staff, and her 12-hour daytime average blood pressure during admission was 144 over 86. So, you know, the obvious question to ask, is this lady taking her therapy, and how do we, how do we know, how do we prove compliance in the context of the blood pressure clinic? The next interesting point to raise is that this is a woman who's obviously had a number of percutaneous coronary interventions. And there's a note um, in one of her clinic letters that during one of these invasive procedures, her invasively monitored blood pressure was significantly less than her peripheral reading. So her systolic blood pressure during the procedure ranged between 83 to 130 millimetres of mercury and diastolic between 45 and 55 millimetres of mercury raising the question really of whether her peripheral blood pressure readings are falsely high because of increased vascular stiffness. And this slide is really just a reminder that as part of the assessment and workup of someone with presumed resistant hypertension, we need to check one, that we're using the right method to assess their blood pressure and check obviously whether these patients are compliant with their prescribed therapy. So <clears throat> the Two points that we would like to discuss, but of course we're open for any other discussion points, are the adherence and the vascular stiffness and probably falsely high peripheral pressures. So this is just to prompt the discussion again. So this is data obviously from, uh, I think a number in the, the audience have contributed to these data. These were patients who were worked up for renal denervation, which we will discuss maybe later um, during the case here. Um, one should assume that these patients were reasonably well worked up before they are admitted for an invasive procedure. But if you look at these data, treatment adjustment normalized blood pressure in almost half of these patients. And there were a number of other things like non-excluded secondary hypertension and a number of other factors that still accounted for apparent treatment-resistant hypertension. We think that we adjusted drug treatment somehow at least, whether it was in the optimal way, it's still open for discussion, so we can probably take this away. We are fairly sure that we have not missed too many cases of, uh, not, not many, too many reasons for secondary hypertension, but poor drug adherence is still in this uh, cohort quite a significant contributor to resistant hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension. And probably just to prompt the discussion here, we have the recent data that there may be drug metabolite monitoring available, and it's probably interesting for the discussion here to say, would this really play a role in the management of the treatment? What these data show, just to very briefly, um, data from Marci Tomaszewski in Leicester, is that people who 
have no discrepancy, that's a li very little zero here, between the number of drugs that they were actually prescribed and the number of drugs that you can find in their urine um, as metabolites, they have a much lower blood pressure than people with a discrepancy of up to six. So they are prescribed six tablets but don't take any of them and have unsurprisingly a higher blood pressure. And that accounts for all clinic and uh, ambulatory blood pressure measurements. So do these new things have a role in clinical practice or is it more like a research tool for very specific cases and how do we actually handle such information if we obtain, obtain it, how do we inform the patients that we do these uh, measurements I think that would be one of the discussion points where I would be interested to, to hear something from you. The other point that Gemma kindly mentioned was the uh, issue that she may have an increased vascular stiffness and it was also one of the questions here and an increased vascular stiffness could certainly lead to a false positive or to a positive or high peripheral blood pressure, whereas the central blood pressure may be much lower. So what we have done um, with this patient is that we um, specifically brought her back again last week for uh, to, just to show you a few pictures from her to have very nice pictures available. Um, so we brought her to our clinical investigation unit and we did a number of vascular studies just to be absolutely up to date here. So these are data here on the carotid intima media thickness. What you see here is that there's a small plug here. You see that the intima media thickness is slightly raised with 1.6 millimeters. It's not extremely raised. She doesn't have a stenosis here, but it is a little bit more than you would probably expect. So that probably goes now down the the root of there is some organ damage, there is at least atherosclerotic disease. What we have also done here is to measure her pulse wave velocity. Now you will see with these tracing again, um, these are from the new Sphygmocore machine that doesn't work with the Miller probe anymore, but does the oscillometric assessment of, of pulse wave velocity. But you will still see that this is not a very nice tracing that we obtained here. And this probably shows again that this is a lady with significant peripheral vascular disease where even this um, semi-automated method is not able to um, capture a very good tracing here. It has been done repeatedly. This is the best tracing that we can present to you. It shows a pulse wave velocity of 11.4 meters per second, which is not extremely high. It would actually be pretty much in the normal range or in the range that we would expect from somebody at that age. The other thing that we did also with this machine, and again, you will see that this waveform here, the peripheral waveform, is not a very nice one. Uh, sorry, that's the, the, the central waveform, but the peripheral waveform was not much nicer. Um, again, it was very difficult to obtain a very nice tracing here. Again, if you do this repeatedly with the device, you would still to some degree believe the data here that her peripheral blood pressure at that point of the investigation was 152 over 88 and her central estimated or calculated blood pressure was 145 over 89. So it is not much lower. Um, it is lower, it's always lower, but it is not that we have a peripheral blood pressure that would be in the 200s and the central blood pressure that would be like 90 systolic. So we do not find a huge discrepancy here. Um, before we start the discussion, just would it make any sense to measure central blood pressure, even if we could do it very reliably in slightly healthier patients? Um, there are reference values now available for central blood pressure, just uh, published last year by Anne Herbert um, in the European Heart Journal. Um, these reference values are available so that we now know for each age category what sort of central blood pressure we would expect. But would this really translate into treatment? Would we, be, would we be brave enough to target our treatment to central blood pressure or not? I think the discussion is still ongoing. In one of the recent issues of artery research, there was a very nice discussion um, about whether we can use central blood pressure in the clinic or whether we should not use it in the clinic. And probably the last slide here is that there is, of course, some data that blood pressure medication affects central and peripheral blood pressure in a slightly different way. These are data from the CAFE study where it was very clear that the more modern amlodipine-based therapy lowered both the central and the peripheral blood pressure, whereas the more conventional therapy with atenolol, a beta blocker, lowered only the peripheral blood pressure but did not affect the central blood pressure very much. So we would like to open the discussion a little bit towards the um, issue of vascular stiffness here and probably most importantly also to the issue of adherence.
Thank you so much. And so um, this part of the talk is now open for discussion. Are there any comments related to, firstly, adherence, compliance, and the issues and the, the real challenges we have with respect to addressing our patients, whether they are in fact taking their medication? And then, of course, once we find that perhaps they're not taking their medication, how do you actually address this with the patient? And secondly, the fact that we've got this really, this great discrepancy between evidence of chronic, quite severe hypertension and apparent um, no evidence of target organ damage, may this indeed be due to, as I said, a differential between central blood pressure, vascular stiffness, and what we're actually measuring peripherally. So the um, floor is now open for discussion, and I can see Jan is coming up to the micro microphone for, for a comment. I would like to make a comment on the last slide you showed from the CAFE study. I think when you look at table three of this paper, there is absolutely no difference in predictive value of peripheral and central pulse pressure. And I think uh, thinking that looking at central pressure will, uh, at least at this stage of knowledge, at this stage of scientific development, will help in uh, managing treatment of hypertensive patients is one bridge too far. I think measuring central pressure is a nice tool for research, but not for clinical practice. Um, that's my comment. Thank you, have, you. you have more? Excuse me? Do you have more comments? No, no? that's the comment. Okay. And then the other thing is, um, I noticed there was a very big difference, a very big difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. Mm -hmm. Now you have, th and the heart rate was relatively high. So um, did you look at the aortic valve? I also met, uh, noticed that if you look at the tracing of the, of the, the artery, there is no incisura, so no, no sign of closure of the aortic valve. There's this patient, and she has calcification. So is there calcification of the aortic valve? Um, is there aortic insufficiency, which, which might explain the big difference between systolic and diastolic? Your point with the central blood pressure reading is, is well taken, and I think that was the point that we were trying to make. Although these tools are available and we have reference ranges for them, we still don't really know how to use them or interpret them in the clinical context. And I don't think anyone would, in their clinical day-to-day -day practice, rely on a central rather than a peripheral blood pressure reading. Her aortic valve was normal on echocardiogram um, on admission to the investigation unit, but I should raise the point that these vascular studies were actually only done last week, as Christian said, and there hasn't been a repeat echo in the recent, recent past. So whether there has been a change, whether her valve has become more calcified, I don't think we can really rule that out. Is that fair to say? I think that's absolutely fair to say, and we had um, discussions as well in, in recent um, sessions at, at this meeting about the workup of patients with resistant hypertension and workup of patients with secondary hypertension. And I think one of the messages that was very, very clear from the other discussions is that we should not just do our investigations at one point mm -hmm. and then say we've done them and rely on them forever. And I think the idea that uh, in somebody with such severe heart and blood vessel disease, there is a progression of this, and not just a progression in terms of her coronaries that have been uh, imaged numerous times, but also in terms of the physiology, like the aortic valve, that would be very important. And I think it's one of the lessons that we learn from this here as well. I think generally we are reluctant to do too many echocardiograms in our normal um, hypertensive patients because we do not gain a lot from this, but in these patients we should definitely have done uh, another echo more recently. I would agree. Christian, um, I think Anna and I have both got questions regarding her treatment. I just want to go back to the therapy. She's now on three diuretics, is this correct? That is correct. Why is she still on three diuretics and does she have any evidence of heart failure and if not, why is she still on the furosemide? Yeah, so well spotted. And I think if, if we want to, to criticize something in the management here, then it is probably also this, um, as, as Gemma said, there were multiple teams involved. So the cardiologists were reasonably keen on the furosemide for reasons that I must admit I do not fully understand. It was also a subjective factor, as we will hear later on after further treatment adjustments, that she just required the frozen to some extent. 
Um, as Jan uh, mentioned at the very beginning, even this combination of the fireside and the loop diuretic to start with was probably not a very rational idea. And then to add the spironolactone because we think we have some evidence, but not realizing that we are then actually at the third diuretic therapy was probably not the most clever thing. So I cannot 100% defend this. Okay. okay, so could I mention, could I come back to the drug screen measuring metabolites in, in the urine? I think, having heard and seen presentations at this meeting and read previous, uh, previous paper that you already referred to, this is really a cheap and good way to check adherence and compliance. And I think we don't use it enough. And one message for me from this case is that it would have been much easier to do a drug screen earlier, even if you need to send the urine somewhere and make sure that it's done properly. In another room, just an hour ago, we were talking about measuring thousands of metabolites for research. Why can't we measure six drug metabolites that are well known to toxicologists in the urine of our patients. It seems rational, easy, and I think patient confronted with the result where there is zero drug level might start taking tablets. So it's not just for you knowing, but it's for the benefit of the patient who might become compliant, I would hope, being confronted with the truth that she hasn't actually been taking any tablets or very few over the last five years. So, Anna, I think you bring up a really interesting point there because, of course, the question then arises, why is the patient not taking the medication and exactly how do you confront the patient? Because um, I think there is some evidence that confronting patients in such a way actually pushes them away even further and then they don't come back to the clinic for follow-up. So I think we have here really something quite interesting with respect to behavioral changes and how one actually as a clinician and healthcare provider deals with these very complex psychological um, factors that in fact we haven't really thought about in the past with respect to uh, improved management. So indeed many challenges, many interesting facts that do arise on apparent fairly simple procedures that we could do, at least for us, to know whether in fact our patients are taking their medication. So let's take a few more questions, um, please, if you would once again introduce yourself. So, Mel Lover, London. Hi, Christian. And so the um, comment and the question. The comment is, um, uh, coming back to the idea of which drugs you may or may not give somebody with uncontrolled hypertension. I um, would take an issue with what's been said so far. I would say that if you prove um, extremely refractory hypertension, there are no holds barred on any drug that you might prescribe to get the blood pressure down because in the face of an unremitting afterload at that, that level, your options are actually dictated by getting the afterload down. And you can worry about various studies that don't incorporate this kind of patient or you can just get on and sort out the blood pressure. Now, is this woman actually hypertensive? So um, I haven't heard any discussion of cuff alerting. I haven't heard any discussion of why the uh, blood pressures in the cardiac catheterization lab, which is the greatest stimulus to hypertension man knows. You know, we have patients frequently sent back from cardiac catheterization. They're so nervous about the procedure. So why is intratial monitoring giving us these blood pressures? And then observe tablet taking in hospital. How well was it done? Did you actually check her mouth afterwards to ensure that the tablets had been digested? So a few comments. I think all very important comments. So the, the, the blood pressure in the cardiac catheterization laboratory, this was probably the thing that was really striking for us. As I say, she should have been a little bit more hypertensive there, but again, we do not know exactly how sedated she may have been at that time, so that may have contributed, but there was obviously a discrepancy between the two. You know yourself, cardiologists do not monitor blood pressure very well during these procedures, so if this was really in parallel measured or if at some point they had a central pressure that was lower but did not have the corresponding peripheral blood pressure at exactly the same time, difficult to say. But we, we were equally puzzled about this, absolutely. Um, Gemma, do you want to comment on the other bits? With regards to our observed medication taking, um, that this is something that our inpatient nurses did regularly. 
I would be fairly convinced that they would check that the patient had ingested the medication and would be quite alert to observing any behaviour that might suggest she wasn't. And although her 12-hour daytime blood pressure during her inpatient stay was significantly lower, I think if she wasn't taking all of those seven antihypertensive agents and then suddenly took them all as an inpatient, would we not expect it to be even lower, maybe? Would she be symptomatically hypotensive? I'm not sure what people think about that. Okay. Gary. Gary. Uh, Gary Dinnings. I um, want to talk about the um, issue of drug metabolites, which I think are the thing of the future. I think they're very, very useful. We, we certainly do it. But we've already encountered a well-known form of non-inherence, that is, people that take their drugs just before they're going to see the doctor, and uh, sometimes that presents as mass hypertension. So I wouldn't want us to get too carried away that this is going to solve all our issues to do with uh, non-adherence with drugs. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think we had a very similar discussion just recently in a, a talk in Glasgow. And exactly when we talk about adherence, we usually mean a longer term adherence and not adherence in terms of taking the tablets on the day before the visit. Yeah. Uh, yes. Just to continue on the same point, um, I have a poster in the session uh, tomorrow um, about <coughs> three patients who were brought to hospital with resistant hypertension and a blood pressure of over 200 systolic. Within 24 hours of admission, all three patients had blood pressure close to 100. And that was only because the nurses stood by the bedside and made sure all the drugs were taken. One of the patients, unfortunately, ended up with a TIA due to low blood pressure. Thank you. That's a really important point to note. Ji Guang. Uh, excuse me. I just want to add two things. The first is uh, whenever you uh, measure blood pressure invasively, for instance, in the catheter uh, lab, you always have to uh, also measure uh, non-invasive blood pressures uh, simultaneously. Otherwise, you would uh, have uh, some, uh, uh, something like underestimation in the invasively measured blood pressure because whenever you do uh, catheters, uh, work, then you would actually expect uh, slightly, sometimes can be substantially lower blood pressure invasively measured. And the other issue is about uh, home blood pressure monitoring. I don't, I don't know whether this patient has ever measured blood pressure at home uh, regularly. And for instance, according to the current uh, guidelines, uh, she should measure blood pressure in the morning and uh, in the evening and for at least uh, five successive days, uh, preferably seven days, then you evaluate according to uh, these uh, home blood pressure monitoring results. And I think uh, these uh, two probably should also take into account. Thank you. I think your first point doesn't need further comments. I fully agree with this. In terms of the uh, home blood pressure monitoring, we have not done formal home blood pressure monitoring in this lady. And I agree in retrospect this would have been a very good way because in addition to these very suboptimal ambulatory measurements that we got here, any additional information would help in that case. Yes. Jan. One important issue when you expect non-adherence is the social situation of the patient, the social context. And I give you an example of one of my patients. She had a very high position at NATO in Brussels. She was 45 and she gave birth to a child and she had treatment-resistant hypertension. And I was suspecting she was not taking her medications. So I asked her to measure her home blood pressure. And she came back after one week, and all the systolic values, you start with 122, the not 100, 172, next one 174, next one 172, next one 174, next one 172. The pulse rate was always the same. And of course, she needed to have hypertension because she had to care for her child and she had a uh, um, uh, benefit of being sick that was almost equal to her salary, which for a NATO employee in Brussels is extremely high. There is the reason why she was treatment resistant. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think we all have anecdotes of, of similar patients. <laughs> Christian, could I just ask you one more question about the patient? Um, could you just remind us what her pulse rate was? 
her, her heart rate. Her heart rate. Um, it was in the, the original uh, measurements, it was around about 80. What, it was what? 80. 80. And she was on a beta blocker? Yes. Mm -hmm. So isn't that in itself a little bit curious? Mm. Okay. So yeah. And we will see that it's getting more curious now. Okay. As we move on to these curiosities, thank you. Let's see the third um, episode in this story. Okay. So just a refresher of the case so far is essentially we have this 60-year-old lady who's at significant cardiovascular risk and has hypertension confirmed on her ambulatory monitor, although accepting not as dramatic as her, her clinic readings. So the question was really how to proceed next with this patient. She was discussed at our blood pressure multidisciplinary team meeting and perhaps another Maybe a clue towards her compliance here is that the patient herself had expressed that she no longer wanted to take any additional antihypertensive medications. Um, so the decision at that point was taken to refer her for consideration of renal denervation because she remains hypertensive, she's at significant vascular risk. So I don't need to remind the audience of the physiology behind the procedure. We've heard quite a lot about that this week already. But basically, we destroy the renal sympathetic nerves as they travel along the renal artery using a radiofrequency ablation, ablation catheter that's inserted percutaneously through the groin. Obviously, this isn't a procedure that we did, did routinely in our clinical practice, and she was therefore referred for consideration to take part in a clinical study that was being run in Glasgow at that time using the Medtronic device. In the context of this study, all the procedures were carried out by the same interventional radiologist who attempted to use a rotational ablation um, and administered at least five burns on each side. So this slide really just shows her clinical course over the kind of 48 hours um, pre and post procedure. So her non-invasively measured blood pressure pre-procedure was 170 over 90, and that was on her seven antihypertensive medications. During the procedure, this lady became profoundly hypotensive with blood pressure of 84 over 42 and developed a profound bradycardia at 34 beats per minute, during which time she required resuscitation with IV fluids and administration of IV atropine. Because of her dramatic response to the procedure, she remained an inpatient for 48 hours following this, during which time her haemoglobin, renal function and ECG were all shown to be normal. On discharge from hospital 48 hours later, her peripheral blood pressure was 105 over 64 and she continued to complain of orthostatic symptoms for at least the next six months following procedure. And I'll tell you what drugs she was on on discharge just over the next couple of slides. So this is her ECG immediately post-procedure. She's in sinus rhythm at a rate of 56 beats per minute, which is slower than her resting heart rate, which as Christian reminded us was in the 80s. And at the point of discharge, she remained on bisoprolol, nifedipine and frusamide. And again, there may be some comments from the audience regarding how logical this particular combination was on discharge. Because of her profound bradycardia, she was referred as an outpatient for a 24-hour ECG. And this confirmed that she, was, she remained significantly bradycardic with a lowest heart rate of 38 beats per minute. So at this point, her beta blocker and her evabridine were discontinued. So this just summarises her treatment pre- and post-procedure. So we can see that before denervation, she was on seven agents. Immediately following the procedure, she was on three. And most recently, in 2015, she remains on just 20 milligrams of frusamide and 30 of nifedipine. Again, the diuretic, I, I believe that has been, there have been many attempts to discontinue the frusamide. We have no evidence of heart failure whatsoever. But this lady subjectively feels that her ankles become swollen every time it's removed. So that's, I think, why she remains on 20 milligrams of frusamide. So to look at her blood pressure response to treatment in the longer term, this is her second ambulatory monitor, and it was done one month post-procedure. Again, we can see there's a suboptimal number of readings here, 
but nonetheless her mean blood pressure is much reduced at 117 over 73 and there's far less variability in her minimum and maximum readings, although we only have one overnight reading. And this reduction in blood pressure has been, I guess, sustained to 10 months post-procedure with a mean blood pressure at that stage of 134 over 78. Okay, and <clears throat> just for a discussion very briefly, I think I don't need to tell you the story about renal denervation because we've heard it numerous times. So just to remind everybody yet one last time that this story started with the Simpli Simplicity HDN1 trial or study that was a proof of concept study, 50 patients enrolled with quite a significant blood pressure response in these people who were in the study. The whole story was questioned a little bit more now by the most recent Simplicity HDN3 trial, which was a sham controlled randomized trial where between the two treatment arms there was no significant difference in the blood pressure response. I think we are all aware of this. The question is, of course, that at that time when we did the procedure, the Simplicity HDN3 study was not yet published. And of course, still today, everybody will report that they have patients who respond dramatically to the procedure, such as our patient here. And the question is, could we have predicted this and would we know that this patient really benefits a lot from this? Now, if the procedure is done properly, um, then we see that obviously if we measure the sympathetic nerve activity, that post-procedure, this would go down significantly. So that would be a measure of the success of the renal denervation. However, it is still very difficult to predict who of these patients will respond to the treatment if we take more readily available markers. And I think all of us know that it's not the traditional markers such as age or blood pressure that really predicts the treatment. And whenever we do not know exactly what predicts treatment, that is the time for biomarker studies. And I just want to show you one of the uh, studies that have been published because also these authors have realized that they have a few patients who respond extremely well to the procedure and others who do not respond at all. And they looked at the number of biomarkers, you see in these uh, rock curves here that the discrimination is not particularly good and that these biomarkers will certainly not be clinically useful to predict the response to renal denervation. And I think a very cautious commentary in the same issue of hypertension also said um, that it's still a long way to go to actually find predictors of, of response here. So in the UK, just to show you the um, result of all this here, is that we currently have a moratorium on the routine use of renal denervation. We still can continue in clinical research studies, but we would not offer it to our routine patients in the clinic because of the experience from the uh, hypertension HTN3, Simplicity HTN3 study. So at this point, I probably want to hand over to Rian again. What we would like to discuss here is what you also have used if you think back two years ago, uh, renal denervation in this patient, or would you think it is a dangerous procedure given her other vascular conditions? Um, and was there anything in the case that um, explained this response so well? As Rianne saw, her uh, heart rate was 80 to start with. After the procedure, we, she was significantly bradycardic. What have we done to this lady's sympathetic nervous system? Thank you so much, Christian and Gemma. So, um, this is the final or third part of the presentation, and um, once again, we welcome discussion, starting by Jan. Christian, we did a meta-analysis, individual subject meta-analysis of uh, patients undergoing renal denervation in the ENCORD network. And there were two patients like yours who had a dramatic fall uh, in blood pressure, and when you go to our publication in Journal of Human Hypertension, you will see there are really outliers in the percent and, and the, the decrease in blood pressure level. And there were two patients that did not tolerate any drug. So probably they were not taking any drug, they were renally denervated, and there was a dramatic fall in, in pressure, and uh, these were two Lausanne patients, so they had uh, also, so they needed supportive measurements for their blood pressure to be sustained afterwards. I think I'm personally, without giving, being able to give you evidence, I'm quite um, convinced that this is also the case in this patient. Um, but just to draw the other alternative explanation would be that this was a lady with an extremely high sympathetic drive. 
that was not, where we were not able to block it properly despite the beta blocker, so she still had a raised heart rate, and she had such a high sympathetic drive that we needed to disrupt this so that after the procedure she was uh, with a much lower sympathetic drive and that this would explain both the blood pressure and the heart rate response. I do not have direct evidence to prove this, but both cases are possible. Thank you. Please, if you would announce you, who you are. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dan Gekonyo from Nairobi, Kenya. I have only two small points. One, I still take exception using loop diuretics as primary antihypertensives because they are not there in the guidelines. And uh, for this particular patient, uh, flusamide and nifedipine combination does not seem a wise choice. Because we, we know that nifedipine itself does cause sometimes fluid retention and pedal swelling around the ankles. And if this lady is still having some swelling around that area, maybe the answer is not to use flusamide, but just withdraw the nifedipine and then maybe use a new, another type of calcium channel or another type of drug that does not require or does not cause uh, fluid retention. Number two, by the time a patient becomes dishonest with his doctor because that was non-compliance means the patient not being honest with you, there's always a question, is it the patient, is it the physician, is it us who are not taking enough time to explain to the patients why they need to use this medication? Because in my experience, the most important treatment for hypertension is the first visit with the patient they must understand why do they have to take the medication. Mm -hmm. What is the risk? How long are you going to take this medication? And, and what are the benefits? If you don't have enough time to explain that on the first visit, we end up with a lot of non-compliance. And sometimes we blame the patient and confront them when in fact we should be blaming ourselves. You make a couple of excellent points. <laughs> Once again, regarding her antihypertensive treatment, I mean, I think we, we said at the start of the um, presentation that we're by no means saying that this is a shining example of the gold standard of how to manage these patients. And there are a number of decisions that when we look back through her case records, we think are somewhat illogical. Um, and again, I'll reiterate the point that there were far too many cooks involved in this whole process with the lady. But you're absolutely absolutely right, you know, patients are not going to necessarily comply with their medication unless they're absolutely 100% convinced of the reason why they need to. Gary. Uh, just uh, two small points in, in relation to fluid balance. Um, the fact that this lady with normal renal function, normal cardiac function doesn't like being off her Lasix um, or Frusamide just raises the possibility of cyclical edema, somebody who's taking them for a few days and then getting a rebound and then thinks they need it. Uh, perhaps another pointer towards um, an adherence issue in this particular lady. Very much so, and especially with this ridiculous once daily 20 milligrams, which is not uh, a yes. pharmacological yes. dose actually and not really following the, the half-life of, of the drug, so I would fully agree. Yeah. And, and a second point in relation to fluid balance, we often feel a little smug when we get someone into hospital and find that their previously uncontrolled blood pressure is normal. But there is an effect of recumbency, and in the first 72 hours after hospitalisation, you have a significant diuresis, and, uh, and you should expect blood pressure to be somewhat lower. It doesn't always nail the issue of non-adherence. Yeah, that was certainly part of, of the experience in this patient. Yeah. Uh, David Silverstein from Nairobi, Kenya also. Uh, you know... Uh, we were all thinking in the beginning she wasn't taking her blood pressure medicine. Her dramatic response would certainly suggest, as you thought also, that she probably was taking her medicines. And to say that her pulse was a little too high for beta blockers, we know that they're uh, way back, it used to be called the hyperadrenergic beta syndrome when I was a medical student a hundred years ago. and. Uh, I have cases of inordinate tachycardias, certainly, where I have one nursing student who weighs around 45 kilos who is on 400 milligrams of metoprolol twice a day, and I'm just getting her pulse down to the high 70s. So I think that uh, I don't uh, blame anybody 
I also suspected this was a case of non-compliance, but with her <laughs> dramatic response, we know there are outlayers like that who really respond to renal denervation, who have a very strong sympathetic nervous systems. Thanks for your support. <laughs> I just want to comment that uh, I think the results of uh, renal denervation in this uh, particular patient should encourage us to do more research in that direction, especially try to find uh, the patients who uh, could be uh, respons responsive to uh, renal denervation. For instance, in this patient, uh, the, uh, she apparently had uh, increased uh, bursts, number of bursts uh, in that measurement, I think pr could be uh, useful also. So th this was not her tracing, sorry if there yeah, was... Yeah, it's not. <coughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Right, Jan? I think the tracing you showed was a single patient at the height of the hype for renal denervation. But what I can add maybe is that we are now looking at renal nerve stimulation as a per procedural uh, measure of the success of the renal denervation. And together with other groups, what we see is you stimulate the renal nerves. In the renal artery, you see an increase in pressure and increase in heart rate. If you successfully denervate, this increase in pressure and in heart rate is almost abolished. And what is more important, if you look at the ABPM response after three or six months, what you see, the abolition in the acute response in the procedure, uh, the abolition of the increase in pressure and the increase in heart rate in response to renal nerve stimulation, if that goes, you get a a significant correlation in the order of 0.7 with, uh, with a decrease in systolic ABPM. So that might be the future uh, to go on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Jan, I don't want to take over your part, but we have one or two slides just to summarize the most recent. Sure. I'd just like to ask you one last question. Does this lady still smoke? She had stopped smoking actually just before referral to the clinic following her first MI. Okay, so maybe so. there's some hope still. <laughs> okay, two final slides. Thank you. Okay, so just um, to illustrate this lady's progress to present, despite her dramatic response to renal denervation, she's unfortunately had continued progression of her vascular disease. Um, due to ongoing claudication symptoms, she required bilateral external iliac angioplasties last year and just had a fempop bypass a couple of months ago. In addition to this, her ischemic heart disease has remained very problematic. She has ongoing angina. She had further coronary disease on a recent um, angiogram and required more percutaneous intervention. And interestingly, in the report of that procedure, she was hypertensive throughout. So just to sum up, um, I think we'd like to thank you so much for your contribution and for um, discussing this case with us. It certainly gave us a lot of food for thought as we were putting it together. Um, we hope that we've highlighted a number of interesting discussion points, including treatment of resistant hypertension, where do we go after three drugs, um, how do we prove that patients are taking their medications, um, Urine metabolite profiling certainly is interesting, but as someone mentioned, patients may indeed take their tablets in the two or three days before they come to clinic. How do we interpret it in that context? We've discussed a bit about the role of assessing vascular stiffness and central blood pressure in these patients, and also that perhaps device-based therapies um, will still be being discussed at these meetings for a number of years to come. Okay, thank you very much. So, Jim and Christian, thank you so much. You've just presented to us the patients that we see every day in our clinics, and certainly we go home with much to think about.